Howdy guys and welcome to episode 16 of Diary of a Security Consultant. Uh, Tony O'Brien here from Security Operative Consultancy Services. Uh, going to the bit that nobody ever sees. It is 10.30 at night here. We just did. Uh, just time to do a video before heading off to bed. Uh, and what sparked, I suppose, it's time to do episode 16. The last one went down very, very well. Uh, some of the webinars that we have upcoming. And I want to talk to you about a, a subject that we've been talking to clients about this week and tell you a little bit what, about what we've been up to because the last couple of our videos have been topic, topic specific, specifically relating to topics that people have asked us to cover and they're a bit more slideshow, webinar type than what we would normally do. So I said I'd go back and do a quick uh, one to camera where we were talking a little bit more about what we're doing and, and different topics that have come up over the last couple of weeks, I suppose, with, with clients. <clears throat> uh, and the topic that I want to talk about on this episode very quickly was risk and um, particularly the importance of understanding risk for people even at an entry level within the security safety risk management uh, industries but particularly concepts of introductory concepts of risk and, and starting to understand introductory concepts of risk uh, and in particular understanding the perception of risk and risk perception as opposed to risk reality uh, when we're dealing with risk, risk management and risk assessments, and especially when we're dealing with the public. I think it's an area that has been shown in the general security risk management industry to be misunderstood or not understood, or certainly not considered by people who are designing risk assessments. And I often talk about when, when people are designing risk assessments, that separation, when you bring in people who don't know the job and aren't competent within the job that they're risk assessing in, to carry out risk assessments that there's often a disconnect between real risk and risk perception and risk assessments are being carried out and when designing risk treatment plans and risk management plans so i wanted to talk a little bit about uh, risk perception um some of the factors that affect us uh, and an important concept that's supposed to understand in terms of risk and decision making which is the concept of bounded rationality as opposed to perfect rationality uh, so I won't spend too long on that, but just to give an introduction, I'm going to introduce a book that I read back when I was starting off uh, understanding I suppose, risk management and actual risk management as opposed to I suppose, paper based uh, risk management. And then tell you a little bit about uh, some of the stuff we've been with clients uh, over the last number of weeks, I suppose. So risk perception, uh, I suppose, what we have to realize, I suppose, when we're dealing with the public and dealing with people is that when it comes to risk, perception is king not reality. How people perceive risk is how they experience risk. And as risk managers, we very much take a, uh, I suppose, a, a paper-based, very factual, evidence-based approach to risk. Uh, we look at the evidence and we look at the actual levels of risk based on, you know, metrics, methodologies, measurements, and that is absolutely correct for us to do. And we design risk treatment plans that measure, act, that manage actual risk uh, as it really exists, which is fantastic for us as professionals. But what we have to bear in mind is that that is not how the general public perceive risk. They perceive risk on their own individual levels based on a wide variety of factors that they experience, not we experience. And that's very important to understand for even you know operational level people dealing with members of the public the difference between being safe and feeling safe and why people act in certain ways toward towards risk why people would engage in risk behaviors non-malicious risk behaviors uh, as a whole so we often talk about <clears throat> people not caring about security or not caring about safety not being aware of the risk etc cetera, etc cetera. But people will always engage in risk where there's benefit to them to doing so. And that's one of the things about risk perception. When we're talking about risk perception, we're often talking about four or five factors academically that we're talking about as influencing people's perception of risk rather than the reality of the risk. And one of those is familiarity, how familiar people are, how often people have engaged in that risk experience before. That would be, I suppose, very familiar to people working within the security industry. I think we can all remember when we worked in the security industry, our very first high risk or medium risk job where we had to deal with conflict or real danger or real risk and how that felt and the adrenaline rush we got and the fear that we had and the nervousness that we had all reaction reactionary stimuli to risk reactions to the stimulus of risk or danger 
now when we experience those same incidents, because we've done it 50 times, 60 times, 100 times, our familiarity with that type of incident is more and we're more likely to engage in risk uh, behaviour than we would be. Uh, another factor, I suppose, in people's perception of risk is the level of personal control they have over the risk that they're, they're experiencing. Um, <clears throat> how they perceive it is how they're in control of it. And we, we see that a little bit now in terms of people starting to protest against things like mask wearing and stuff like that. But I suppose I always put it down to it. it's the difference between um, driving a car and being in the passenger seat of the car. You know? When we are driving a car going at high speed, there is a large amount of risk involved. But as the driver, we have control over that risk. We can control the mechanics of the car and speed, etc., etc. You're in the exact same car, driving at the exact same speed, experiencing the exact same level of risk in the passenger seat. You're at the exact same level of real risk, but the perception of risk is broadly different because you're in control, or you have less control, sorry, over that risk than you would if you were in that driver's seat and controlling the level of risk. Uh, another factor is uh, voluntary or involuntary exposure to risk, uh, how we have engaged or come across that risk. Um, so, for example, uh, an involuntary risk, one that is forced upon you, pandemic at the beginning, risk of a terrorist attack, those are not things we, we voluntarily go for. So, if we take from a security point of view, it's the difference between you standing at your post and choosing to engage in a violent situation to save somebody, as opposed to you standing at your post and a violent situation coming towards your post. We are more likely to have a higher perceived level of risk for the violence coming upon us than we are when we engage willingly in the violence because we are voluntarily engaging in that risk behavior. We have chosen it as a choice. Uh, another one, the dreaded, the, the dreaded outcomes, I won't spend too much time on, but the one that I most suppose um, like to indicate to people is people are more likely, it's the benefit, the benefit factor, I suppose, people are more likely to engage in risk where there was a benefit. You know, whether it makes them feel good, where there's a prize at the end of it, a common, uh, a common goal at the end of it, people are more likely to. Uh, so for example, uh, high risk activities, martial arts, scuba diving, um, rock climbing, stuff like that. There's a high degree of risk, but there's a huge benefit. Ego sometimes a little bit can come into that as well. So that is the guy who engages in high risk behaviors such as physical violence because they know that their mates will get them a pat on the back and they'll have a good war story at the end of the soldiers. The fine benefit to engaging in that risk behavior. If the audience was not there, would they still choose to engage in that behavior? And risk perception is important. How people perceive risk is important because it affects their decision making uh, and what they're willing to engage in and what they're not. We could make people we could do a risk assessment, have risk controls, and have measures in place that keep people very safe. But if people don't feel safe, then that risk assessment and that risk management is, uh, is kind of wasted on them or lose a little bit of value. The opposite also applies. People may be very much at risk, case in point, the current pandemic. There may be a very high level or a medium level, and depending on the environment you're in, of pandemic or infection risk or whatever you want to call it. But if people, and we're starting to see this now from fatigue, at the start we saw this, there was a real fear. There was hundreds of people a day being hospitalized. People were dying we were in the news all the time. ICU beds, emergency measures, lockdown, stuff like that. There was a real, both a real and a perceived fear involved and people's behavior reflected that with high levels of complaints. Now we start to see numbers dropping. We start to see steadying out at the bottom. People going back to a little bit of a sense of a normality. The real risk may remain, albeit at a lower level, but the perception of risk is now plummeted. People are much more familiar with the risk and are therefore more likely to engage in risk behaviors because they've become complacent to the risk slightly, I suppose. And when we're dealing with people outside, so for example, the security person who's standing outside a, um, a supermarket and they were you know dealing with people all along in the crowds and they're so grateful and they're so thankful and now we're having arguments with people over wearing masks and sanitizing and why they have to wait you know it's not that they don't understand the risks it's that they become more familiar with the risks and their perception of the risk is different to what you know the reality of the risk to be you've been briefed on a, on a thorough risk assessment i hope um 
it can be sometimes frustrating for people who've gone to the effort of investing in real risk management and real risk assessment to see that the public perception of risk is so different to the reality. Uh, but perception is king in most of those cases, and that's important for us to understand. Uh, another term uh, that important to understand, and again, if you're going to talk about risk management and understanding how people uh, use the psychology of risk, is this term of bounded rationality. Herbert Simon's bounded rationality. Not a new thing, uh, used in economics uh, quite a bit uh, to decide markets and how people make buying decisions. But very important for how people make risk decisions as well. And bounded rationality effectively says that we do not make absolutely perfect rational decisions. None of us do. We are bounded in our rationality by a number of factors. And those factors uh, can include our own cognitive biases and heuristics and stuff like that that we'll talk about in a second, uh, a certain amount of time constraints that we're placed under. And a big factor that's becoming a huge issue in the last number of weeks and months is poor information or misinformation that people are acting on. So we have people's cognitive biases, understandings, values and beliefs. We have misinformation being fed or poor information being fed to people. And then we have a time constraint that people feel they're under all feeding into this bounded rationality. Um, and then we do what's called satisficing, which leads to suboptimal decision-making at the, at the end of that. So when we are talking about dealing with our cognitive biases and our um, time constraints and our misinformation, we are never going to make optimal decisions. The goal for us is to make the best suboptimal decisions. So having the best information that we can get. We're not going to have the perfect information, the best information that we can get having an awareness of our own cognitive biases and heuristics, and we'll talk about some of those in a moment, um, and realizing that we are not altogether always under the same time constraint as we might emotionally feel that we're under. That's also very important. And I was talking about this with a fantastic group of people today, um, very experienced people within the industry, about risk-based mindsets and the, um, the challenges of decision-making under pressure in bounded rationality. Now, uh, what I was trying to get across there is that it's looking at it with a sense of self-awareness to realize, okay, what are my biases? Knowing what the biases are and being self-aware enough to recognize them, realizing that not a lot of decisions we make are made under time constraints and dealing with the misinformation that we've had. You know? So an example of that might be from a security context that we are, um, I'll give a door supervision example, for example. We are called to a fight, an argument in a bar. When we hear this radio call, all we know is that there's a fight in the bar. So we're uh, applying our, or going to apply ourselves to a situation, engage in a situation based on poor or lack of or misinformation, poor party information. We put a time constraint on ourselves to get there really, really quickly. And we have our own cognitive biases about people and fights and behaviors and how they behave in the bar. So we're making suboptimal decisions. Whereas if we are you know, if we have better information or if we stop and gather better information and realize that the time constraint is still an argument, people are still arguing, we have time to make a decision. Um, <clears throat> and we're aware of our cognitive biases and, and our perceptions. We often make much better suboptimal decisions. It will never be the perfect decision. Now, what I often say to people operating in the security industry is that when you're out there on the ground on an operation or a tactical level, you are making suboptimal decisions in bounded rationality but bear in mind that when it comes to justifying that you are going to be judged in perfect rationality you're going to be judged by a person sitting in an office that didn't have the fear is under no time constraints has different cognitive biases maybe about the security industry and about your actions and is acting with total information they have all the information and they have hindsight and that's something to bear in mind when we put ourselves in situations where we're making much judgments about people and about incidents. And that's something that I'm starting to see through social media and pages and stuff like that. People writing in asking me questions about incidents they've been involved in um, and things like that. We're starting to see that real increase in, in poor suboptimal um, decision making because of misinformation. I had a person contact me today who got in a fight, a physical restraint related fist fight almost with a person and physically removed using physical restraint from a place because they refused to wear a mask. Now, if you think that actual risk, why are we engaging in this behavior? 
why are we forcing people to wear masks? Because of risk of aerosol spray. PPE, very last resort, apart from other things like you look at our um, risk reduction pyramid, you know, you have eliminate, isolate, reduce, all those above it, you know, PPE being the bottom down here. So we're PPE to reduce that risk, so that's our last resort. And because a person would not don PPE, they got rid of all the other control measures, hygiene, lack of dis uh, social distancing, hand hygiene, uh, use of um, cleaning products and, and, and stuff like that, body hygiene, no physical contact. They overrode all of those senior control measures because a person was not enforcing a junior control measure. And you have to think about the suboptimal decision making involved there. Why? Because the information that they were given was the biggest risk is a person entering the premises without a mask. Now that's not to say people should wear masks. Absolutely, if that's the guideline, you should wear masks. But they are one line of risk management in actual risk management. But the perception out there now among society is that that they are the ones in the news. There's a recency bias, there's a familiarity involved in the mask wearing now that is somewhat making people forget about the other control measures that deal with real risk as well, not just the perceived risk. You know, so some of those cognitive advice, oh, we could talk all day about cognitive advice, so I'm not going to go in there. Uh, what I will do actually is point you in the direction of a fantastic book. Uh, when I was starting to learn about um, risk and perception of risk and the psychology of risk, and I suppose this is what I spend quite a lot of my time doing now and talking about people, um, I pick, obviously the, the seminal people in this, uh, you've got Daniel Kahneman, you've got Paul Slovic, um, You've got, I've got many, many when it comes to psychology risk. If you want to talk about new ones and the psychology of violence risk, you've got people like uh, Gabriel Schneider and his uh, Brazilians. Um, you've got um, Filippo and his name will come to you in a second. But one of the books that I started reading at the time was this book here. Uh, it's a book called Risk by Dan Gardner, and it talks about the psychology of risk. And I remember reading it, so you can see from the book, like it's beaten up, and if you look in it, got kind of like a underlines all over it and notes taken all over it and dog ears and stuff. I've read it so many times, but basically what it is, it's a, it talks about the psychology of risk and fear uh, quite a bit. Um, now he's a journalist, but he, he goes into the, the walks of the famous researchers, Kahneman and Slovich and, and, and guys like that, people like that. Um, and he breaks it kind of down in layman's terms. So if you're interested in, in the psychology of risk and the perception of risk, uh, I highly recommend that book. It's a, it's a fantastic read about uh, risk psychology, how society perceives risk against the actual risk and some of the silly and suboptimal decisions that we make uh, based on that. So let me just quickly go through some of the, some of the chapters. It uh, talks about the risk society, uh, Stone Age meets Information Age, about you know, how we have Stone Age brains. Uh, if you've ever read, actually, another fantastic book that I suggest, and he's one of the seminal writers on psychology risk, uh, Dr. Daniel Kahneman. The one, uh, surprisingly, he was a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize for Economics. Uh, and he talks about system one and system two thinking uh, in his book. It's a fantastic book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, absolutely highly recommend it if you want to work out how your brain works under pressure and under stress. Uh, but um, Dan Gardner in this talks about Stone Age meeting Information Age and how our brains are designed for Stone Age decision making applied to an Information Age. He talks about herd mentality, uh, feelings in fear, crime and perception, uh, terrorism, things like that, and how the, the perception of those things is sometimes morally different from reality. And for people who are engaged in the security industry at any level, whether you're writing risk assessments, implementing risk assessments, designing risk assessments or designing procedures, it's a very important concept to understand the psychology of perception and the psychology of risk and how people view risk, not just how risk is. Very easy to study risk in terms of methodologies, numbers and metrics, and that is brilliant. We should if you're a risk management or a security person, you should absolutely understand that. But we also need to understand in tandem with that, how people perceive those risks, not just how the risk is, because those are going to be really different things. Um, well, then we'll talk a little bit about what we're going on with our clients and what people are terming the new normal, I suppose, uh, and getting on to, again, management of risk and this bounded rationality thought. Again, uh, this week we spent some time with a, an international client of ours, they're a medium-sized retail chain, and we do some work designing SOPs and risk management frameworks for them. Um, and this, to give you an example of risk management um, at a preventative level rather than at a responsive level, 
we were asked to design some arrest procedure, uh, to review some arrest procedure policies they had and implement some arrest procedure training online virtually or help them design some uh, online virtual training. Uh, and we went back to, well, you're looking at arrest procedures, so you're talking about reducing risk, but you're implementing arrest procedure training in the middle of a pandemic. And that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. So we had to go all the way back to start and we completely changed the, the client's outlook on what it is they want to deliver. So now what we have designed is our SOPs, our assignment instructions, our risk assessments, and our virtual training, our virtual SOPs, are all based not on arrest procedure, but on managing risk of theft. So we do not have an arrest procedure SOP anymore. We've got a managing risk of theft. And arrest procedure is a tiny part of that. We talk about managing the risk of theft at a primary level, a preventative, deterrent, consultative communication level, at a secondary level, as in an incident management, a communication, a um, engagement level, and then finally at a tertiary level, a, an enforcement and arrest level at the bottom, which is forming a small part. But it comes back to my principles of risk-based thinking. Are you looking to design a procedure because you think that's what it should be doing, or are you looking at designing a procedure that actually minimizes risk? If you are designing a procedure because every other retailer has that procedure, that's fine, but don't cut yourself and call it reducing risk. If you really want to reduce risk, then you have to go back to the start, look at the root causes, measure your, your outcomes and your potential outcomes, um, get some academic guidance on it, and then put some practical operational, um, I suppose, surrounds on us on the on the ground and that's what we've been doing so i encourage everybody who's listening to this whether you're a, a security practitioner uh, or whether you're in risk etc etc start looking at things less from responsive i go into lots and lots of clients and i look at their sops and very many of them have things like uh, responding to violence arrest procedure uh then we have some other good ones um accidents and scene preservation procedures. Instead of moving all the way forward, looking at root causes and starting to measure and manage risk out here rather than after something has, has happened. If you want to talk about managing risk, talking about eliminating, reducing, isolating and controlling. You know, if you want to talk about responding to risks after they have been damage control now at this point. You know, that's something I've been bleeding on about from the very, very start of this pandemic outbreak thing. You know, companies saying, oh, um, we didn't activate our business continuity plan uh, during this because it was just a business as usual risk because it was so drawn out. And that's fine. Other people says, we actually, since this pandemic, we have started to work on a business continuity plan. A business continuity plan being designed in the middle of a pandemic is not a business continuity plan. It's a disaster recovery plan. It has already happened to you and you're backtracking. So don't try and cut yourself and say we have a business continuity plan that we're designing right now. It's it's a little bit late for designing a business continuity plan for a pandemic when you're in a pandemic. This is disaster recovery or risk response. Uh, you're now responding to an incident that's already happened to you. Uh, so that's some of the stuff that we have been up to, designing a lot of something that's kind of become a speciality of ours, uh, virtual SOPs, uh, walk through, talk through SOPs for clients, uh, which they seem to be getting a lot of value of, and the day job and the training job is more of a fantastic group of people on a very high level, uh, conflict resolution, stroke risk management program uh, over the course of 10 or 12 days, fantastic program with experienced people who know their stuff, there's, there's no better feeling as a, as a trainer or facilitator and working with experienced people who have a growth mindset and are willing to learn and engage with the material and question the material. That for me shows a real growth mindset, not just people who are willing to participate and engage, but question the material and see how they can twist it and turn it and apply it to their own roles. I think that's one of the most enjoyable uh, experiences that I can have. Working on some tenders for some clients, hopefully going to come to fruition this week. We're glad last month uh, we had the government multi-party framework agreement for security service in Ireland. We had three tender clients going on three different lots, 100% success rate, so we're delighted with that. Uh, we're working on launching a new website next week for the more corporate end of things. Uh, security operative consultancy services will be changing in the next while. Uh, our sister company is in Elite Risk, uh, so we're going to be launching our brand new Elite Risk um, 
website. And then we've got some other exciting stuff coming up, including uh, a competition coming in August for some really, really good security for frontline security officers post pandemic uh, and regardless of our security. So, so, um, <clears throat> so until probably next week, I'm probably going to come back and do another topic specific one next week. Uh, we've got a webinar coming up uh, the week after next, which is on contemporaneous note taking and report writing. Um, the event write link will be live for that this week. Uh, next week we'll do another one of these face to camera ones but until next week on episode 17 this is the end of episode 16 another rant about risk and risk perception thank you very much for your time and I'll see you all in the next one